Chapter 2. The Magical Temple, or Psychic Laboratory. We will now move on to the Magical Temple and the basic equipment that you will need. Some of you will already have a temple. Others will not. No matter. I will describe the building up of a fully functional temple. Then, we will discuss how you can best adapt it to your circumstances. Putting aside all previous ideas of a temple, let us look at what a temple really is. In short, it is nothing more than a workroom or a psychic laboratory. In a real laboratory, you would expect to find test tubes, balances, Bunsen burners, and so on. The tools with which a chemist carries out his or her work. The equipment and layout is chosen and arranged by the chemist to suit his or her particular needs. Naturally, one does not clutter up the laboratory with irrelevant items. The whole place is, in fact, an extension of the chemist and his or her ideas. It is a place where one can work in comfort, where everything has a place and everything has a use. Like the chemist's laboratory, the temple also has equipment with which the magician works. It is arranged according to his or her needs, and it is also an extension of the magician. The chemist deals with acids and alkalis, the magician with energy. Both use their minds and exert an influence over their own environment. The temple is a working laboratory. Like the chemist, the magician needs a space to work away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. It is quite impossible to work effective rituals with the television blaring away and the neighbors dropping in for a chat. You need to have somewhere secluded, and a temple is the only answer. In it, you can shut out the world and work at your magical practice without being disturbed. Let us now have a detailed look at the building up of a typical magical temple. The size and dimensions are of little relevance as long as there is enough space to work in. Always follow for the fact that one day you may feel like having fellow magicians inside your temple in order to work group rituals. The best place to put a temple is as far away from public view as possible. If you have visitors or friends staying, they might start asking awkward questions. Cellars or attics are ideal. If this is not possible, then a spare bedroom will have to be used. Put a strong lock on the door, as curiosity can often get the better of people. And you'll be surprised how attitudes can change when other people discover that you have these sorts of interests. Their minds, motivated by Dennis Wheatley in films like The Warlock, will get more curious and then fear and superstition will step into the picture. Usually what they do not know or understand, they will invent and imagination becomes quite fertile, invariably in the wrong way. You will need to invent some sort of cover story, or you will need to exclude people from your home. After many years of personal experience, I have chosen the latter. However, it is up to you to decide. Having found a spare room, clear everything out. If you need to decorate, then do so. There are no special colors. Simply decorate to taste. If the room has a window, you will have to find some way of covering this up, so that anyone outside cannot see what is going on. What is the temple for? What are we going to use it for? The answer will dictate where everything goes. The temple is a place of work. It is a place where we find peace from everyday life, where we can exert a magical influence, where we can learn about such things. Everything should be placed according to a pattern that is both universal and personal. The scheme is quite simple and natural as it is based on the symbol of the encircled cross of the four elements. Everything in creation conforms to this scheme and the use of these mysterious elements which are vital in effective magic. More will be said about this later. Now you need to work on the temple. You have four walls, so each could represent an element. If you are lucky enough to find that your chosen temple aligns to the magnetic points of the compass, well and good. If not, it does not really matter. Circumstances will often dictate choice. Pick a wall to represent east, as this is the usual starting place. The rest will follow in the natural order of the compass. Now, standing in the corner of the temple with the eastern wall facing you, the southern wall is to your right. The western wall is behind you. The northern wall is to your left. These walls will be marked in some special way, so that you always know where you are. 
Here are some useful associations. The east represents the rising sun at dawn and the season of spring. It also represents the element of air and the magical sword. The south represents the midday sun and the heat of the sun in summer, together with the element of fire and the magical wand or rod. The western wall represents the setting sun in the evening, the autumn, and the element of water and the magical cup or chalice. The north represents the star starlit sky of midnight, the winter, the element earth, and the magic shield or pentacle. In the center where you are standing is the seat of power and the eternal light of your real self. The elemental colors are these. Air, yellow. Fire, red. Water, blue. And earth, green. Later we will work these attributions into the temple. For now, just bear in mind which of these walls represent these important points or quarters, as they are sometimes called. Just like the laboratory, before we move in the benches and cupboards, we need to decide where we are going to put things for maximum use of space and efficiency. Also remember that you're dealing with flammable items such as oil lamps, candles, and hot charcoal. You can have carpeting, but if you do, make sure you have a fire extinguisher or at least a bucket of sand, just in case. Both carpets and oil lamps have one thing in common. They burn. With simple, sensible precautions, a carpet is quite all right. You could use floor tiles. The choice of color is entirely up to you. Remember, white tiles need a lot more cleaning than colored ones. So tiles, or if you can afford it, parquet flooring, serve just as well. Having tried various formats over the years, I have found that ordinary hardboard nailed directly to the floorboards produces a nice flat surface. It is not a fire hazard and does not cost a fortune. If you like, you can paint it with a quick drying paint, or you can paint a floor design. Again, the choice of color is up to you. Now, before you start painting magic circles and angelic names on the floor, let me explain about such things. The idea of working in a circle is correct, as you will see later, but the common practice of setting up a circle and clearing the place of working by various purifying and banishing rites is superstitious nonsense. The idea is that you ought to chase away all the undesirable influences and then stand protected in your magic circle. What are these undesirable influences? They are supposed to be demons and elemental spirits. At first glance, this may appear quite logical. However, it is not. The real magic circle lies in your mind, and it certainly is not there to keep out demons and spirits. The only undesirable influence ever likely to invade your temple are the ones brought in by superstitious beliefs and by other people. Superstition should never be a part of magic, as it will turn the whole process into a shambles. Likewise, keep other people out of the temple unless you either know you can trust them or they are magically inclined in a positive way. Magic is not a social get-together or a hobby. It is a way of life. If you want a floor design, by all means have one, but use it to enhance the appearance of the temple. Make it symbolic. Two concentric circles with a hexagram in the center work quite well. Or you can use an equal-armed cross inside a circle. Then you have an important symbol, the encircled cross of the four elements. As this symbol will be the basis of your magical system, it is a very fitting floor design. The next thing we must consider is the altar. This is nothing more or less than a work surface. One of the more traditional designs is a double cube. Usually it is about 3 feet high and 18 inches across. It can easily be made from plywood or chipboard, fastened together by screws or nails. The top half is painted white and the bottom half is painted black so that it looks like two cubes. If you prefer, it can be made into two separate 18-inch cubes. As a meditation symbol, it looks impressive. However, if you need a bigger area, say for candle magic, then any shape or size will do. It is all a matter of choice. A small cupboard is just as good and it has the advantage of having space to store things in. Altar cloths are always a good idea as they add color and tidy things up. Again, color is up to you, and this largely depends on personal preference and the type of ritual you are working. Always try to add to a ritual by using color and scent and so on. Use your ingenuity and get involved in the planning of a rite. Here are some suggestions. You could cover the altar in a gold or yellow cloth to represent the central sun 
and then use a smaller altar cloth to suit the ritual, such as blue for Jupiter or green for Venus. Another idea is to have four main altar cloths, one in each of the elemental colors, to change these at season. Change these at each season. Again, secondary cloths could be used for rituals. You do not have to go to this trouble, but any involvement in your temple is bound to pay off as you are projecting your personality into the room. You are making it an extension of yourself. Try as many different ideas as you like. It will not do any harm. With altar cloths, remember that you do not have to purchase high-quality silk or velvet unless you feel like doing so. Ordinary cotton or similar cloths are just as good. They are as magical as you make them. However, do not allow superstition to cloud your judgment. The placing of the altar causes many arguments between different practitioners when common sense ought to prevail. Remember that the temple has to be functional. It is not a shrine to some god. It is a workroom. As always, it is a personal choice based on circumstances. It is best to have the altar in the center. This way you can face any direction. No matter what the dogmatics say, you do not have to work towards the east. Generally, you can work eastward in spring, then change to south in the summer, west in the autumn, and finally north in the winter. If you do not like the idea of a central altar, then place it on the wall of your choice, or move it around as suggested. The temple lights are the next step. Do not use electric light. Natural light from candles or oil lamps look much better and affords opportunity for ritual work. First have some form of illumination on or above the altar. This represents the central light and is used to signify the inner power which you have. Other temple lights ought to be lit from this flame. You have a choice between candles and oil lamps. The latter are more useful because you can get colored funnels and can control the flame of light from low, which is useful for meditation, to high if you are reading a script. In addition to the all-important central light, you should have four other lights to represent the quarters. Again, use lamps or candles. The choice is yours. The quarter lamps are placed on shelves or stands against the appropriate wall. They are used symbolically, especially in opening and closing of the temple. More will be said about the quarters and the four elements later, but for now it will suffice to say that these four lights are important, so do not neglect them. Any old lamp produced in a hurry and stuck on a box near a wall will get proportional results. The more you put in, the more you get out. There is no need to spend a fortune on these things. It is the care and thought which is put into the selection of and the work with magical equipment that matters. Make your choice of equipment with care. Do not just purchase something because it is cheap or expensive. The cost does not matter, but the intention does. The quarter lights ought to be colored. This helps you know which wall represents which quarter and which element. If you have difficulty in getting colored oil lamps, then use colored candles. It really is worth it and you are helping to build the correct associations. The next important items are pillars. The pillars are used for many things, but mainly as a symbolic doorway through which you pass to your inner temple. You will, have, you will be shown how to use these later on, but in any case, do have something to represent this important doorway. Large pillars can be made from 3 to 4 inch diameter plastic pipe painted on meaningful colors, one in black, the other in white. Lamps may be placed on the top, but do not do not make certain that they have a fairly wide base. Do make certain that they have a fairly wide base so that they do not fall over. Failing this, a pair of candle holders placed on the altar or quarter will do. It is the inner work that matters, and pillars are useful aids to this end. In magic, you have to use association. We've talked briefly about color, and now let us look at scent. There is no need to buy an expensive brass thurible or censer. Any metal dish will do. Fill this with sand, and you have an, the ideal incense burner. To burn incense, you need to burn some charcoal blocks. These come in assorted shapes and sizes. Some are pure charcoal, and others are quick lighting. Igniting the pure charcoal is quite simple. Place it flat on the sand in the burner. Add a small quantity of methyl alcohol, then light it. When the flames die down, the charcoal will start to glow. The quick lighting blocks merely need lighting with a match or taper. 
take care as these things do tend to splutter. Once the block is lit, simply add a small quantity of incense and the perfume will soon fill the temple. A word ought to be said about incense. There are many people who supply incense, but not many of these people know what they are doing. In magic, any mixture of bits and pieces that only seems to be right will not necessarily work, so it is within so it is with incense. Scents bring associations into mind, so it is important that you get the right associations. In magic, you have to use the five senses. The mind and the body react to these stimuli. There are traditional scents for all four elements, the planets, the zodiac, and the spheres on the tree of life. In fact, for any magical work, you need to use the right scent. It will promote the right associations and reactions. The amount of work that goes into making incense is quite staggering. It is a job for experts. Avoid using cheap, ready-made scents. The, uh, the ideal place for your incense burner is in the south where the element fire naturally belongs. It is a good idea to have some general incense that you can burn at regular intervals just to keep the place smelling nice or for peaceful meditations and deliberations of a general nature. Evesham or Prink Nash incense are very good for this. You can probably buy these in charcoal blocks at your local church supply shop. A useful alternative to this is joss sticks. The better quality ones, such as earth scents or spiritual sky, burn for about half an hour each and are available in many different scents. Color and scent help create the right atmosphere for magic, so do use them. You will need other items in your temple. First, the four weapons. These are the sword, rod, cup, and shield. At this stage, there really is no need to buy or make these. Before using the weapons, you need to understand the elements and how they apply to you. This will be covered later. For now, it will suffice to say that the sword and cup will inevitably have to be purchased, while the rod and shield need to be made. There is not a great deal of expense involved or laborious work. Having these weapons is eventually a good idea, but leave the matter until later. Robes are always a good idea. When you enter your temple for working, you need to feel differently. There are two points to consider. First is pre-ritual relaxation, which helps you put aside everyday matters and attune to the magical part of your mind. Second is ritual attire, which helps you feel right for the temple. You are an ordinary human being outside. Inside, you are a magician. And it helps if you feel and look the part. You can compromise by having an alternative form of dress. Anything that helps you feel different should be used. Robes can be as elaborate or as simple as you like, but they should enhance the ritual. Many variations are possible. You can have a plain robe, white or black. You could also use a robe the color of your birth sign, or for different rites, wear various colored sashes or cords. You do not need to have a different robe made specifically for every ritual. This would be very expensive and totally unnecessary. Remember that the robe you are using is a magical tool to help attune your mind. While on the subject of robes, we ought to mention the Wiccan practice of working naked. You do not have to do this. The reason that is often given is that nudity helps the power to flow. Let me assure you that the power can heal disease the power that can heal disease or bring great personal happiness is hardly likely to be stopped by a fraction of an inch of cloth, unless you believe it will. Sexual fetishes often become entangled in magic, and this is one of those times. Finally, you ought to have some place in your temple where you can use a cassette recorder. The main use of sound reproduction and magic is to provide you with sound effects and music. Rituals without music are very dull affairs. The right type of music, as with color and scent, will greatly enhance your magical work, especially in meditation rites. You can, of course, use classical music. The Planets, by Holst, is quite useful. Some of you might prefer church organ music or meditation music, and there is an excellent selection available today. Modern music is not suitable. Make and keep an index of your music. Head the card with the type of ritual or meditation for which you intend to use the music. Having described the ideal temple and its basic equipment, we must consider those of you who have no space available. For you, think in terms of a temporary table. Any room is suitable and you do not have to move a lot of furniture around. You will need something you can use as an altar. 
The quarter lights and central light can be put away in a closet until you need them. Then just find a place to put them around the room where you were working, so you have points of reference for the all-important quarters. Do make certain that you are not going to be disturbed. Before the right, lay everything out, and at the end, clear it away. Disguise it in some way, so that other people will not notice. You can use small wall brackets for lamps. These can be quickly converted to hold ornaments. Alternatively, you can make or purchase four stands on which you can place your quarter lights. Use a bit of ingenuity. There's always a solution to insufficient space. In truth, you do not need to have a temple. Eventually, you'll learn to do such things and without any equipment. For the time being, do make every effort to find some place for your temple, since much in the way of ritual experience can be lost. Necessity, too, is often the mother invention, and quite often I've had to put up with what, was, what has been far less than ideal. If you cannot have the ideal, do not let this stop you. Make the best of existing circumstances. Eventually you will attain the ideal, and you will learn by your experience. During many years of magical work, I've had to get around many awkward situations. Quite often, circumstances dictated how my temple had to function. I was fortunate that my first temple was quite large. It was, converted, it was a converted spare bedroom situated upstairs, away from the view of people who came into the house. My second temple, by contrast, was very stark. The altar was sandwiched between a wardrobe and a dressing table. The quarter lights were on four wooden stands made from parquet flooring. That was it. No floor design, no drapes, no useful brackets for thurbles, and so forth. At the end of each rite, everything had to be cleared away and put into a locked cupboard. The altar had to be disguised by putting ornaments on it. Certainly far from ideal, but it did work, and I learned firsthand many things that I would not have learned otherwise. I very rarely use a temple set up now. I carry my temple around in my mind. Before I leave this subject, I ought to describe my last situation, which seemed to be impossible. The only available space was a broom cupboard that measured 40 that measured 66 inches long and 33 inches wide. Inside this space, I managed to get a double cube, two six-foot-high pillars, lamps, thurible, weapons, and a cassette recorder. On more than one occasion, two of us worked magical rituals in there. You had to be very careful about the amount of incense you used. On a hot summer day, you really began to appreciate the values of nudity. However, it was a challenge that was met and bettered. Life, and particularly magical work, are constant challenges. Do not duck out. Use your ingenuity. Be enterprising and resourceful. It always pays off. Now let us have a look at the essential items. There is a mania at the present time for buying books on magic and equipment. Usually nothing is ever done with these articles. They adorn shelves and temples and they are shown off to interested friends. Now let me make this clear. I am not saying you should not buy equipment and books. It is a good idea to have some of these things, providing that there is a need for them, providing that there is a definite purpose. Before you buy, think, do I really need this? What do I need this for? You see, it is so easy to look at the claims as to the potency of certain incense, books, and equipment, and then react. What are you reacting to? Superstition, not fact. Real magic is within you, and it is easily found if you know where to look. Now, as far as equipment is concerned, you will actually need very little. Every item must be there for a purpose. Avoid buying anything you can make yourself. There's a lot to be learned from these crafts, and, of course, you are adding more to the general personal involvement. Apart from this, only buy those things that you really need and which you use to enhance your ritual work. There is no point in paying out a small fortune for a magical sword. Instead, look around the junk shops or buy an ornamental one. They are bound to be cheaper and just as good. Work on the sword and personalize it. I will tell you how later. Finally, if you do have a temple, then do follow the advice I'm giving you. Clear everything out and start again, looking at every item to see if it is of value. If you do not have a temple, start to think of ways you can make one, as you will need some quiet place in which to work undisturbed. King Solomon was reputed to have a, had a magnificent temple. 
and again, he could afford it. It is a good idea to have a mental picture of an ideal temple. Move toward this, but do not try to do it in a week. Good working temples are built up gradually and with care and thought. The more you put in of yourself, the more you will get out, and this has little to do with money. Gold pillars and ebony altars may look good, but what real value are if they can be purchased without a second thought? A cardboard shield made with love and care is worth far more than some expensive article bought casually with a credit card. Care and dedication really matter. Work within your present financial limit. You do not have to sacrifice to the gods. They will not even notice, but your real self will. Involve yourself with your temple and inject your personality into it. Make it yours. The Silent Center Within Those of you who are engaged in realistic magical work will find the practical work and advice that follow of enormous value. Not only will it give you peace of mind and help you to cope more easily with stress, but it will also form a valuable aid to inducing the right attitude of mind prior to ritual work. Peace equals power. Therefore, a calm, tranquil mind can do far more than one in a state of turmoil or bothered by the problems of the day. The secret of successful magic work lies in controlling the mind because magic is the science of using the mind. Therefore, the ability to begin magical work in a condition of peace and tranquility is bound to remove the problems of fear, doubt, uncertainty, and tension that often prevent success. In today's world, we live with pressure and stress. We are taught and shown from an early age that we must sweat and strain to achieve results. We rush around to keep up with the pace of everyday existence, and we must concern ourselves with every second of the day with attempting to control the many confusing facets of our civilized society. The net result is stress, nervous tension, and emotional breakdown. As the problem increases, more and more people succumb to the misery and many give up altogether or turn to hack remedies or modern medical techniques. Neither work effectively. The hack remedies, and there are many and many disguises, depend on belief, so unless you have complete faith, they will never work. Modern medicine prescribes what can only be described as dangerous chemicals. These may seem like the easy way out, but they are not. Apart from side effects and the fact that the individual comes to depend on these drugs, the principles used are quite wrong. Drugs treat symptoms. They do not treat causes. This is very important, yet little realized. Now, I am not about to imply that you should abandon your medication or throw caution to the wind. Far from it. By using relaxation, you can learn how to manage without these things. But this is a gradual process, as you will see. I would suggest that you allow relaxation to do its job. By practicing the techniques that you will be given shortly on a regular basis, you will soon notice the benefits, and as you increase in strength and confidence, you will learn how to manage without artificial chemicals. The sensible way to treat stress is by offering meaningful advice and understanding. The answer is always very simple and natural. We have been taught to accept everything that appears obvious as being absolute fact. Facts are created by our minds. This is the secret of magical work. What the mind can convince, it can achieve. The power of the mind is truly limitless, for better or for worse. Therefore, it is very easy to create conditions of poverty, misery, bad luck, and illness without being consciously aware you are doing it. The conditioned reflexes we have, each inherited from society, are seen as facts. If you believe them to be true, you will, of course, react in a negative fashion. Stress, worry, depression, and anxiety are the result. This forms a vicious circle, because what is believed to be true comes true, so the problem goes from bad to worse. It is just as easy to create the opposite effect, and therefore halt the cycle by simply changing your attitude of mind. Change your mind and you change your circumstances. Before any change can take place, it is necessary to discover peace and tranquility and then make this a habit. From then on, the road to recovery is open. However, it must be discovered 
It cannot be induced by drugs. The method I shall now describe will, if followed carefully, result in tremendous changes in terms of health and peace of mind. So ask yourself this. Do you really want a happy, peaceful life with the ability to cope easily? Or are you quite content to muddle along in a state of perpetual confusion, stress, and worry? All I ask is that you practice the relaxation exercise I will give you on a regular basis. Do not be put off, do not make excuses, and do not let anything or anybody get in the way of what is to be your own personal path to peace. Results are always proportionate to effort. I cannot promise instant success, but I can tell you from personal experience that if you persist, you will know peace. You will enhance your life in ways you never thought possible. When you are relaxing, you must be able to relax fully. So find somewhere quiet where you will not be disturbed. A bedroom is ideal. Privacy is the key word. If you have somewhere secure, you will find that it is far easier than if your mind is constantly returning to the possibility of someone barging in on you. You can also inform people that you are not to be disturbed during relaxation sessions. Prevention is always better than a cure. Having attended to these problems, all that remains is to do is to sit or lie comfortably. Sitting is often the best way to begin, but lying down gets far better results. When you are reasonably proficient, you may deepen the relaxation exercise even more. This is done by laying down, not on a comfortable bed, but on a hard floor. The head may be lifted slightly, but that is all. This may sound counterproductive. One would imagine that a hard floor will be very uncomfortable and distracting. The reverse is true. Instead of being supported by a bed, the body is mildly, uncom mildly uncomfortable. To get around this, the body must relax even more. Try it for yourself. You will soon see that this is the case. As a final point, it may seem crazy to lie on a bed of nails, but with the right training and attitude of mind, it is possible to relax very deeply into trance states with this method. The way that it works is quite simple. If you are uncomfortable, you must relax even more to get around discomfort. The greater the discomfort, the deeper the relaxation. I do not advise you to try a bed of nails, but I certainly endorse the use of a hard floor. You are about to commence a period of relaxation in which you will learn to relax the whole of your body into a condition of peace, tranquility, and calm. You will experience peace and tranquility that will stay with you throughout your daily life providing you practice regularly. The more you practice, the more you will feel the benefits as calm and poise become part of your life. Preparing for relaxation. You're going to prepare for relaxation by putting your body into a pleasant state of rest and comfort, by turning your attention to the five extremities of your body, raising and lowering them to a position of rest one at a time. Direct your attention to your right leg. Raise it a few inches. Hold it for a moment. And allow it to sink to the floor and rest. Direct your attention to your left leg. Raise it a few inches. Hold. And allow it to sink to the floor and rest. Now do the same thing with your right arm. Raise it slowly. Hold. Allow it to sink and rest. Now your left arm. Raise, hold, let it sink, and rest. Finally, we move to your head. Raise it slightly, hold, and allow it to sink and rest. Now you must regulate your breathing to a slow and steady rate. Do not strain in any way. Breathe in, hold, breathe out. Breathe in, hold, breathe out and so on. Continue to breathe slowly in and out for a while. When your breathing is steady and relaxed, begin the gradual relaxation of your body. Direct your attention to your feet and imagine they are becoming heavier and heavier. Then relax your lower legs from ankles to knees. Feel them relaxing. 
Move your attention to your thighs. These are large muscles. They are easy to relax. Allow them to do so. Now turn your attention to the hips. Let them relax and sink slowly downwards. Feel them relax. Your legs and your feet will feel, un feel comfortably relaxed as they get heavier. Turn your attention to your abdomen. Feel the muscles relax. Allow them to do this slowly and gently. Let them sag and then become very heavy. Imagine that as those muscles relax, so your internal organs also relax. The muscles of your back are becoming heavy. From the base of your spine to your neck, you are relaxing. Allow your entire back to sink, to relax deeply. Relax into peace from your neck to your feet. Your fingers are relaxing. They become limp as they sag under their own weight. The muscles of your forearms are also relaxing. Let them go limp. Your upper arms relax and go limp. Let your shoulders sink downwards. Allow them to relax. Let the muscles of your neck relax. Let them go limp. The whole of your body from neck to feet should be relaxed and comfortable. Let your jaw relax and find a comfortable position under its own weight. The muscles of your face are relaxing. Relax your eyes under their own weight. Your forehead relaxes and the back of your neck relaxes deeply. Your entire body should be very relaxed. Continue to relax into peaceful tranquility. There is nothing else to do but rest. Your body will heal itself and your nervous system will be strengthened and you will acquire more energy day by day as you practice this exercise. You will lose tension and discomfort as peace of mind and body revitalizes your entire being. Spend about 15 minutes to half an hour relaxing, more if you wish. At conclusion, return, return to normal, carrying with you peace and tranquility. This will stay with you and with practice will become part of your life. Move your head, lift your arms above your head and stretch from your fingers to your toes. Stretch and come back to normal.